Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Rick Peterson from ASA. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our webinar presentation, Detangle Modern Dose Finding Designs, a tutorial. Our presenter today is Dr. Yuan Ji from, uh, professor, excuse me, Professor of Biostatistics at the University of Chicago. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by the Biopharmaceutical Section of ASA. Um, so you please, uh, you can submit questions at any time, but I just would like you to do so using the Q&A feature instead of the chat feature. It's just easy for us to uh, keep all the questions in one place and uh, keep track of them. So with that, I think we'd like to begin. Uh, Dr. Ji, if, if you would. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thanks for the introduction, Rick. Uh, and thanks for coming to today's uh, webinar. I know there's another webinar going on, I think talking about COVID with vaccine. So I appreciate uh, that you joined uh, this one. And today I'm, well, you know, uh, I won't introduce any new methodology, but more uh, as the title suggested of a tutorial to try to um, give a review and also perhaps a uh, critical um, analysis of you know, existing dose finding designs uh, if you're familiar with uh, phase one dose finding trials, uh, in, especially in oncology, uh, you probably realize there are many, many new designs that have been published. This is great for the field, uh, but at the same time, it could be a little bit um, confusing, maybe, or maybe unclear on you know, which designs does what, what, what their pros and cons are. Uh, and uh, what to expect when you actually apply them in practice. So this, is, this talk is meant for uh, try to uh, clarify a little bit based on my uh, uh, personal view and uh, involving research of my own work and others uh, in the past uh, uh, three decades. And this is my conflict of interest. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, I made two plots essentially uh, describing the same message on the left and right are the two uh, figures that show the rep uh, some representative designs um, uh, that have been published since uh, 1989. Uh, so <clears throat> in, with such a small pl uh, space, uh, it's impossible for me to contain uh, all the, all the uh, pu publications in the past three decades. Uh, so uh, naturally, I can only include some of the uh, notable uh, designs publications, and I apologize if I missed anyone's work in this plot. Um, it's not meant to, you know, include everything in it. There are too many. But roughly speaking, as you can already probably see, that uh, in both figures, uh, there's a starting point of the three plus three design, which is uh, published in 1989 as a statistical paper. Uh, and then in the next year, there's a CRM, which is the, uh, the model, first model-based design, continual reassessment method. Uh, and uh, for a long time, CRM uh, and uh, its variations improvement have been the focal point of research uh, in, for almost uh, over a decade. Uh, until in around 2007, there is uh, some development in, in the uh, so-called interval-based designs, uh, notably by the first the TPI design, the toxicity probability interval design, and uh, another perhaps less well-known but should uh, be mentioned, which is the CCD, the cumulative cohort designs. Uh, these uh, two methods started to look at the, the, the dose finding from a different angle and basically trying to use uh, probability intervals for statistical inference and uh, try to use simpler models uh, to alleviate some of the practical burdens uh, in the application. Uh, and along the way, there are uh, extensions and uh, various uh, development and BR, BRM, the Bayesian, Log Bayesian Logistic Regression Method, <clears throat> was published in 2008. It's also a fully model-based design. Uh, it has uh, the element of interval inference in it. But then uh, <clears throat> I developed the MTPI design as an uh, improvement over the TPI design. And later, there, more recently, there are other interval designs, sorry, <clears throat> including the Bayesian optimal interval design, the Boeing design, 
uh, and uh, more recently the MTPI2 design, which uh, turns out to be the equivalent of the keyboard design. And uh, the most recent one based on uh, my own work is the I3 plus 3 design. So you can see based on the colors, uh, the green ones are, uh, I, call it, I categorize them into the interval based designs. The, the blue colored designs are the non-interval designs, but regardless if they're uh, blue or, or green, I call them model based designs because the statistical inference is based on a parametric uh, uh, models. Uh, some of the parametric models have a dose response curve and some don't, but they are all based on models when, they, uh, when the statistical inference is applied. Uh, with two exceptions, the three plus three designs and I three plus three designs, they are completely rule-based designs. So meaning there are no models, um, probability models in the background to dictate uh, the posterior inference. The inference is purely based on a deterministic set of algorithms and that's why they are called the uh, rule-based designs. Uh, moving to the right, it, it's essentially the same methods uh, arranged in a different ways. Uh, so you can see the role, the role based designs are three plus three and I three plus three. Uh, the, there are, um, and then the model based designs are divided into complex models, meaning they are based on uh, those response curve and uh, uh, sometimes hierarchical models in the Bayesian setting. Uh, and then there are simplified models um, that are in these designs using very simple independent beta binomial uh, hierarchical models. Uh, and then there, uh, in my view, there's a very interesting development, especially in the last year when, you know, the I, I3 plus 3 design is introduced. It seems to be, a, uh, to me, a spiral evolution that the field moved uh, starting from the role-based design to into model-based design for almost three decades. And then to my own very surprise that uh, uh, I, this, there seems that a, a new and uh, smarter rule-based design may do the job or may at least do as good a, uh, of a job as the, the other model-based designs. And so I will explain this, uh, why uh, this is my view and that's part of the objective of this webinar. So I'm going to go through uh, these, using this figure, to go through these uh, main representative designs uh, as a review and at the end uh, provide uh, some guidance and uh, recommendations on the practical applications. So I start with the three plus three design, which is probably uh, doesn't need any uh, further uh, introduction. It's very well known. It's uh, the clinician's favorite in practice. Uh, and this is a, a diagram we published about uh, five years ago, uh, essentially to put a three plus three design into a single diagram. Uh, and you can see it's a rule-based design because there are no uh, modeling uh, at all and uh, all the those finding decisions are pre-specified uh, and the rules are relatively simple. So in the first step, uh, we treat three patients at a given dose I and depending on how many of the patients have, have the toxicity outcomes, the DLTs, uh, the three plus three design provides uh, corresponding decisions. So for example, if no one has DLTs, then the decision is to escalate to the next higher dose, dose I plus one, and go back to step one. If there's one DLT out of the three patients, then the decision is to enroll three more patients at the same dose, uh, which would result in six patients. And depending on how many uh, additional DLTs that we observe uh, in the total of six patients, the three plus three provides uh, reasonable decisions uh, for uh, the next step, uh, the next step being either the uh, dose is escalate uh, or the trial is stopped and the MTD is determined. Um, and if there are more than one uh, DLT out of the three patients, then usually the decision is to deescalate to the lower dose. Or if the uh, dose current dose I is already the lowest dose, then we want to stop the trial. Uh, but in regardless you see the rules uh, out of the three plus three design uh, goes up to six, six patients. If, if you want to enroll, let's say the seventh, eighth or ninth patients, uh, the three plus three design doesn't give you any uh, guidance on what the decisions should be. And then the, if you follow strictly of their rules, then the trial will uh, almost always stop 
with no more than six patients treated at any given dose. So uh, to summarize, this is a role-based design. There are no statistical models, which makes uh, them very easy to understand, especially for the clinicians and non-statisticians in the team. Uh, it's transparent. All the decision rules are pre uh, spec uh, specified. So you can look at it uh, before the trial starts. Uh, there's a societal acceptance, especially in the uh, clinical society. Uh, the, some of the main uh, problems we have known for years, it's pretty naive and it's rigid. Uh, so there are a few things. One is um, there's no uh, reason why we should stop a trial or the dose finding uh, at, at, at the seating of six patients per dose, right? The six is nothing magic here. It's just that the rules only goes up to six patients. Uh, and uh, the uh, according to some research, uh, as you can see, the set of rule doesn't really tell you what your target MTD is, which is the highest the toxicity probability uh, at MTD. Uh, it doesn't tell you what it is, uh, but based on the rule and based on some research using simulations, uh, turns out the, the MTD target is around uh, one out of six or one out of third, one out of three meaning about 16 or 17% to 33%. And that's the MTD range. It's a pretty wide range. It could, you know, uh, in some, in the modern drug development, uh, you might want to uh, be more precise on uh, achieving the MTD in terms of the target toxicity rate. And the performance of the three plus three in terms of operating characteristics. So imagine you repeat the simulation uh, many times and then you run the three plus three design you ask about uh, the probability of finding the true MTD. The performance uh, like that depends on the number of doses. The more doses are there, there are in the, in the scenario or in your trial, uh, the worse the three plus three perf uh, design uh, in terms of its uh, ability to find the MTD. And that's not de uh, desirable. Um, and also uh, there is a, a very large variabilities in the MTD identification. So if you dig a little deeper, let's say you run these simulated trials and you look at the trial data and you compare these data to the trues, you, know, you must generate some trues before you run the simulation, uh, you'll find out with only up to six patients a dose, sometimes the trial data uh, in no way reflect what the trues is. And you know uh, that those are the variabilities where vulner vulnerable in practice because we're, we don't know the trues. So, um, in bottom line is um, the six patients per dose, um, it feels, uh, you know, uh, standard and uh, accepted in the clinical community and then it, it enables very fast and small phase one trials, but really it doesn't do any uh, good in terms of decision making. For example, with such small data, it's very hard to support RP2D, the uh, recommended phase two uh, doses. And usually after the three plus three uh, trial, you, uh, one would actually do a, a additional expansion cohort studies, which actually cost uh, resources and uh, uh, leads to the awkward situation where after the cohort expansion, you, you all of a sudden find out the dose is not what you want than what you do, right? So um, the three plus three design has been you know, criticized over the past many, many years, especially by statisticians. Uh, but more recently, including some papers uh, the statisticians wrote, including myself, uh, that are published in clinical journals. So there's a JCO paper I wrote with Dr. Su Jian Wen. Uh, at that time, we were basically looking at the performance between the MTPI design and the 3 plus 3 design when the sample size is matched. In many comparisons, uh, we found that uh, the through simulations, the model-based designs seems to perform much better than the three plus three design, but sometimes use uh, double or triple the sample size based uh, compared to the three plus three design. So we investigated the performance uh, of MTPI when the sample size is matched, and it turns out uh, it's still safer and more reliable than the three plus three design. And more recently, this is a publication out of a dose finding sym symposium. Uh, and the authors uh, uh, are from both industry and regulatory agency uh, jointly uh, uh, wrote this paper and uh, made a very clear and uh, unequivocal statement of, about rendering the three plus three to, to rest. 
uh, and this is published as a CCR clinical cancer research focus paper. So it seems that uh, in the recent years, the three plus three design, at least in the clinical society, is no longer the you know the go to uh, designs. I think many st clinicians still use it uh, in as a default, but uh, they are aware that there are other designs out there. So the next one, uh, phase would be the model based design, and uh, we will definitely talk about the CRM, which is the most well known one. Um, and uh, uh, with the CRM, there are also uh, other development over the past, uh, again, three decades, including the escalation with uh, overdose control, EWOC. Uh, I also categorized BRRM, the Bayesian Logistic Regression Methods, as uh, a design that uses complex models. Here, complex is relative. It's not really uh, super complex if, if we compare them to, you know, like big data modeling or to other, let's say, genomics or uh, cancer, uh, other other types like COVID uh, uh, models, they're relative to the ones that I'm going to introduce, which use just very simple independent beta binomial models. Uh, the complex here means there's a dose response curve usually. So let's look at the, these model-based designs. The MTD is uh, specified uh, with a target probability rate. Of, let's call them P sub T. Uh, and the BRM actually uh, introduced probability intervals in their inference, uh, but in general, both uh, designs uh, assume there's a dose response curve. Uh, it can be usually a sigma noid shaped curve, uh, like the ones on the right here. It could be a power uh, curve or logistic curve uh, with parameters that define these curves. And then as a Bayesian inference, uh, prior distributions are imposed on these uh, parameters. Uh, and the, the decision, uh, at least for the CRM, is based on a very uh, intuitive one, which is to see which dose uh, has the posterior estimated uh, toxicity probability closest to the target, and that dose should be the MTD or be the, be the next dose for treatment, treating the patients. Um, and for the BRM, it actually uses posterior probabilities of the intervals. One of them is uh, interval that uh, is appropriate, it's right on the target. And if that probability is large enough, then you would uh, continue to uh, treat patients at the dose. If other intervals has largest the posterior probability, then you escalate or de-escalate. Uh, so the, it makes a perfect sense in terms of st statistical principles. Uh, you, we want to borrow information across doses. That's what the, these dose response curves do. Uh, and uh, we want to simplify our understanding of the nature using uh, uh, param parameters that describe these relationships. And hopefully this will achieve uh, more efficient statistical inference. And uh, the only problem with these designs is that uh, operationally they are very difficult to execute. And as we, as we know in practice, uh, of clinical trials involves uh, many, many other people, and it's actually uh, mostly driven by clinicians, right? In, at least uh, in pharmaceutical industry and uh, research institutions. So it's, ve it's very difficult to convince and explain these uh, complex uh, concept of statistics to non-statisticians. So usually we would need a, st a statistical expert for the inference and decision making. Uh, and then it's very complex for the clinical team to understand. Uh, and the, even for statisticians, if, if the people are actually not in the field of, you know, those finding modeling, uh, the, 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 you know, the, deci the choices of these priors and also the inference uh, for those uh, assignment could be confusing at times. Uh, for example, there are, uh, and also there, there needs to be additional work to, um, to control the performance of the model-based inference. Sometimes the inference is solid, but uh, ethically, you know, the physicians just are reluctant to do it. So something like uh, overdose control uh, needs to be implemented. So there are many factors that needs to be uh, considered when we actually run a trial based on these, uh, these designs. Uh, and again, this is another uh, thing related to the model-based inference being very solid and reasonable, but uh, there are ethical, strong, very, uh, very strong ethical and uh, safety concerns that would not allow, for example, an escalation of more than one dose level, something like that. Uh, so, you know, um, practical uh, 
gatekeepers needs to be there to make sure the model in based inference are of, uh, in accordance with the ethical constraints. Uh, so that's why the two uh, the model based designs uh, have been there for a long time. They haven't. Uh, they there are trials that are based on these designs, but they're really not super popular. Uh, and then the their group their researchers out there who uh, I applaud their effort to continue push uh, for the application of these uh, solid designs. So for example, this is a paper published last year. Uh, about how to use a continual reassessment method uh, to design a dose finding uh, study, right? Um, and uh, uh, even after hundreds of papers on the CRM that have been published, uh, we still need a paper like this to help uh, um, mostly uh, non-statisticians, but maybe some statisticians too, to learn how to design a dose finding studies using CRM. So this is a pretty, uh, this is a, a evidence to, to, uh, to uh, demonstrate, you know, the challenges uh, in practice when you want to apply these uh, designs. But fortunately, there are more and more software available in the same paper. The authors very nicely list some uh, existing free and commercial software that, uh, that is available for CRM. Uh, I added the two more um, <clears throat> designs. They're both uh, commercial, which include the CRM uh, as the choice in, in their modular. So moving on, uh, the rest of the designs try to simplify the operation, uh, but uh, maybe sacrifice a little bit of uh, statistical models, at least the principle in building uh, statistical models and inference. And the, the reason for the sacrifice to me is to really make the application easy and also try to um, find a compromise between the ethical constraints that sometimes are against the statistical principles because we're treating humans we can't do things that, that even you know the modeling based inference agrees uh, but impose potential risk on patients and those inference will be override uh, so that that uh, these efforts are down to uh, basically simplify the uh, inference in, in the statistical uh, front so these are the efforts started in 2007 uh, Except for the I3 plus 3, all the, the other designs, the TPIM, TPIM, TPI2, or CCD and Boeing, uh, I'd still call them model-based designs. I know uh, there's a term model-assisted design in the field. Uh, that's fine. Uh, to me, the mo if we use the par parametric model, like beta binomial uh, models, and the inference is based on the model, then that's a model-based design. Uh, there's another type of design which is model free or rule based design such as uh, 3 plus 3. These models still account for variabilities. When we write down these probability models, then inevitably the variabilities of the data are already accounted through the probability uh, distributions. However, they are pretty flexible and they perform well. The, the performance here again account for the ethical uh, constraints uh, that uh, in that we're treating humans. Uh, if we just ignore ethical constraints and look at the pure statistical performance, then the model-based inference should be the best here. But since we're uh, dealing with humans, we want to look at uh, you know, safeties, for example, in the simulated results. <clears throat> and because <clears throat> of the sacrifice in using these uh, very simple models, uh, the design itself become very simple and transparent. It almost have the same level of simplicity as the three plus three designs, which, uh, which involves a pre-tabulated decision table, uh, and I'm, which I'm gonna show later. So going into just two examples that I'm most familiar, uh, these are the two papers that uh, I was involved, um, the MTPI and MTPI2 designs. The idea is uh, very simple. First of all, the models, I don't even, uh, I didn't even write it here. The model is essentially using binomial likelihood and beta priors uh, independent across all the doses. Uh, and with such a conjugate setting, then the posterior probability of the toxicity probability at each dose is also a beta distribution with known parameters. It's in closed form. <clears throat> the <clears throat> inference is based on something called the UPM, uh, initially published uh, in my 2000. 10 paper. Uh, 
so basically it, it, uh, it's a, a statistics uh, that uh, is defined based on the ratio of the probability uh, of the area under the curve. Let's say there are three intervals for each interval. You can calculate the area under the curve. That's the probability of the interval and divided by the length of the interval. So this mimics the unit prob probability mass and that's the name. But later in 2017, I found out actually uh, this correspond to the marginal posterior probability of the intervals. If the interval, each interval is considered as a model, <clears throat> and then we build, a, we um, we construct the equivalent Bayesian model selection framework. And uh, in that paper, so we proved that the the UPM decision rule is actually the base rule, which means it minim uh, minimizes the uh, posterior expected uh, zero one loss. But you know, it's not the main point here. Uh, the main point is by doing this, then essentially what we, what we end up with a design is that we want to specify three intervals. Uh, the equivalence interval is the one sitting in the middle. It's um, a PT plus and minus a small value called epsilon. So PT is our target and the equivalence interval is an interval close to our target. Uh, this, uh, the, the <clears throat> values of the two boundaries are, can be considered as the lowest and the highest toxicity rate for those to be considered as the MTD. And this interval is elicited from the clinicians uh, before the trial starts. So once we specify the target and the, the equivalence interval, then based on this simple inference, all the decisions uh, for any possible trial data can be pre tabulated and then being presented as a table like this. So <clears throat> the table uh, generates these decisions in terms of escalate, stay, de-escalate, uh, de-escalate, and uh, unacceptable, meaning remove the dose. Uh, they can be pre-tabulated based on the UPM inference and beta binomial models uh, upon specification of the two things. One is the target for the MTD the other one are the two epsilons that define the equivalence interval. So once you provide these uh, input, then the table will be automatically generated. And they, they are transparent and simple for cl even clinicians to understand. For example, uh, the column here represent the number of patients treated at the current dose. And then depending on how many of them have DLTs, for example, zero have DLTs, then the decision is to escalate. If one of them have DLTs, the decision is to stay, and two is de-escalate, three is de-escalate and remove the doses. And you can look at the decisions uh, for, let's say any number, in this table only up to ten, nine, but this table can grow to any number, and look at them uh, before the trial starts and explain to the physicians, so physicians can actually look at themselves uh, and uh, uh, they feel much more comfortable when they look at table like this and maybe they'll point out some things that they don't like and where then you can modify based on tuning the uh, input parameters. So uh, that's why the, these, um, uh, this, the, these uh, designs, uh, uh, what, what I call them is they, the, the decisions are still based on models. They're generated based on models, but they're presented as rules, right? Uh, so therefore uh, some folks call them model assisted designs. So just a little bit on the MTPI-2, uh, it turns out uh, originally in the MTPI, there were only three intervals, the middle interval, which is the smallest or shortest equivalence interval, the interval to the left between zero to the left boundary, that's the underdosing interval because the probabilities are very small here and to the right are the overdosing interval. <clears throat> uh, the MTPI-2 design divide the left and right uh, larger intervals into smaller sub intervals with the equal length. The length is the same as the equivalence interval. So it turns out later uh, we found based on the UPM, the marginal posterior probability inference, uh, there is something called the Occam's razor, which is a Bayesian term of a model selection based on penalized likelihood for frequentists. It would penalize the, uh, the uh, inference of the, uh, the underdosing interval and the overdosing interval, which are longer than the equivalence interval. Uh, this is a 
good thing, again, in pr uh, statistical principle, when we select models, we want to penalize for model complexity. But uh, uh, these um, Occam's razor, uh, even though it's a solid, based on solid statistical theory, it generates some uh, decisions that are deemed too risky in practice, just like the sometimes CRM it needs overdose control because the solid statistical inference uh, again sometimes can contradict the ethical constraints, and we 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 don't really model those ethical constraints, or it's very difficult to model them. So the MTPI two uh, basically found a solution if we. Uh, divide the longer interval into smaller interval of equal length, and then we have we uh, expand the model selection across all these smaller intervals. Then all of a sudden, the Occam razor does not come into effect because the models are of the same size. And uh, I'll show later, you know, what this do, uh, do to MTPI two. But uh, I just want to pause and quickly summarize uh, that it's it's very important to. Uh, note that these tables uh, kind of uh, open a new chapter in, in, you know, retrospectively on how those finding designs can be done in practice. Uh, and this colorful table with all the decisions uh, that can be pre-tabulated really helped uh, uh, physicians and uh, the, you know, statisticians even in, the, in practice to have a second choice uh, or third choice. The first one being the three plus three, and the second one, the CRM and BRM, the model-based designs. And the third one is this, which is also uh, very simple and transparent uh, for the non-statisticians uh, to understand. And so as a result, uh, the, the many practical trials now are using these designs and uh, <clears throat> because the cl clinicians finally, they, they can understand and they're willing to try it. So that, and later after 2015, since, uh, uh, <clears throat> so in, you know, CCD and Boeing designs, they further simplify the uh, approach in the background, but the presentation of the designs are still similar uh, to this. <clears throat> so again, going back to the MTPI and MTPI2, uh, the one of the criticism you probably heard about from the MTPI was that, uh, for example, here it's more uh, common commonly discussed when there are six patients treated and three of the patients having DLTs. And when I think the target uh, toxicity probability is about 30%, uh, then the decision from the MTPI is to stay. And you look at this number and you say, oh, I have six patients and half of them have DLTs. Why should I still stay? So this is particular, particularly a problem in the review committees and the in, in the regulatory agency where safety is of the number one consideration, we have, you know, this biased view, which is the good biased view of protecting patients because these are human subjects. So the concern is, oh, the <clears throat> observed rate is 50% and that this is decision is to stay, right? Uh, and that, as I mentioned that the MTPI was actually based on the base rule so statistically minimize the expected zero one loss. So why is it still doing it? And uh, this is uh, caused by the Occam's razor. Remember the stay decision correspond to the equivalence interval and which has the smallest uh, uh, lens. And therefore in the posterior inference, the model automatically favors that and then would like to ch choose it e even when the evidence is uh, suggest suggesting something else especially when the sample size is small. And then if you look at uh, the, another case, which is very sim uh, interesting, uh, when eight patients are treated and four of them have DLTs, then the decision is now de-escalate. So you can see the inference, uh, actually understand the variabilities behind uh, the, uh, the, info, uh, the, the sample size, right? The larger when we move from six to eight, even though the observed rate is still 50%, then here the models start to realize uh, the 50% is indeed probably plausible, and then we should do or we should not consider 50% as uh, acceptable when our target is about 30%. But if you go to the, the other direction, when four patients are treated and two of them have DLTs, then the decision is still to stay because there's little information, uh, only four patients. But again, uh, in practice, we're very used to having you know 
like three plus three design with six patients treated, it would never uh, have a stay decision when three patients are treated. So we still want to work on that. Uh, uh, and as such, the Occam's razor uh, is blunted and, and MTPI2 use smaller intervals. And then therefore all the, uh, these uh, things are corrected. So this is a comparison between the MTPI and MTPI2 uh, designs. MTPI2 use smaller intervals of the same length and uh, based on the same inference, then all of a sudden the, uh, the decisions of these you know, stays uh, turn into de-escalate. Okay, so that was the uh, time you know, when I was trying to figure out what happened, what's happening to the MTPI with, with these rules and trying to understand the difference between statistical principle and uh, the ethical constraints. So let's move to uh, even more simpler model-based or model-assisted designs. Uh, the CCD designed in 2007 and the Boeing designed in uh, 2015. Both designs still use the beta binomial models, but the, the difference is in the uh, inference. For the, for the MTPIs, uh, the inference is based on the posterior probability of the intervals. Uh, for the CCD and Boeing, the inference is based on point estimate, which is essentially the, uh, the ratio of the DLT number over the number of patients treated at a given dose, essentially the observed toxicity rate. Uh, so it's, it's even more simplified uh, in, in, in the inference. So uh, Boeing design has been, you know, uh, become very quite popular in uh, some uh, uh, pharmaceutical industries and also you start to see that they are being applied in uh, practical trials. Uh, so let me first introduce what the Boeing design is and its connection to the CCD design. Uh, it, it, the rules are extremely simple. We don't even need to mention the beta binomial modeling, but um, uh, essentially what the Boeing design um, can you know, pre present in the practice is basically track two numbers. One is the number of patients N uh, treated at any given dose, at the current dose, for example, uh, and then the number of patients having DLT, so let's call it Y. Then Y divided by N is the observed toxicity rate, very simple. And you just compare them to those three intervals. Remember there are the equivalence interval, the underdosing interval, and the, the overdose interval. And you compare this uh, observe the ratio to the boundaries of the intervals, and then you can co uh, conduct these uh, decisions in terms of escalate, stay, and de-escalate. So if the, if the observed rate is less than uh, to, uh, the left boundary of the equivalence interval means it's underdosing, then you want to escalate. If it's in the equal equivalence interval, then you want to stay. If it's uh, greater than the uh, right boundary, you should de-escalate. I think uh, I made a mistake here. The e equal sign here should be on uh, the on the two uh, boundary cases here in instead of the uh, equivalence interval. But you can see um, even with almost no statistical training, uh, as long as you understand the fraction of y uh, over n, and as long as you can compare numbers, you can execute this uh, design, right? So the about this rule, these rules are actually originally uh, at least what I can find was proposed in the uh, CCD design. It was uh, published in two thousand seven. Uh, the design was kind of under the radar because it was the paper was published in a very theoretical fashion, trying to uh, show the theoretical properties, especially asymptotic properties of rules like this, which generates a Markov chain. So it wasn't written for practical you know, field uh, in terms of applications, but the rules are the same. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Boeing did one uh, additional uh, uh, safety rules uh, that were or or originally published in uh, early papers, which uh, stop the trial early or exclude uh, the doses with too much toxicity based on posterior inference. So by combining these uh, very simple interval rules with the safety rules, uh, Boeing achieved a very desirable uh, performance. Uh, but if you look at the rules, then they make, uh, they make largely make a lot of sense, right? So for example, <clears throat> if we use a, um, a regular interval of let's say 30% as a target, plus minus 5% uh, 
as the equivalent interval, then the decisions are to escalate when uh, no, no one out of three, so treat three patients, if no one has DLTs, then escalate, if one stay, and if two or three deescalate, and so on. So you can do this for any number of uh, patients, not necessarily three or six. So that makes it very uh, attractive. Uh, very interestingly, from theoretical point of view, uh, I, I started to uh, wonder, you know, how do you uh, decide the lambdas, the two boundaries of the equivalence interval. In the early designs like MTPI, MTPI2, these are intervals, uh, the equivalence intervals are elicited from the physicians, right? So they are the lowest and highest point that the physicians feel comfortable to treat the patients, uh, to treat the dose as the MTD. In other words, they are the lowest or highest point to not uh, leave the dose uh, if they're if they're safer or they are more toxic, then the physicians would not feel comfortable to continue using the dose for the patient treatment. And however, Boeing did a very interesting operation. They optimized uh, these intervals through a procedure. Uh, and uh, so the entire process is such that you first elicit uh, interval uh, from the physicians, let's call them uh, plus minus epsilon. And then using the optimization procedure, the Boeing design changed them to a different interval, which is the plus minus lambdas. And the, uh, uh, the interesting point to me was that the, this optimization was actually done before the, any data was observed. So such an optim optimization is very interesting to me because you know, you, you're optimizing something user provided before seeing any data. So how is that done? Uh, this was intriguing, and then until very recently, I, I figured out how uh, and why this is uh, potentially justified using theory. And this is the theory. Uh, I'm going to take just a, a little time because there's quite a bit of a decision theory behind. Um, so a classical decision theoretical uh, optimization framework uh, based on just the one-time decision making. There's no sequential decision making uh, in the sense here. Uh, is to formulate the decision framework, which involves the data, which also involves a model. In the Bayesian sense, the model uh, includes uh, the likelihood, and then the prior distribution and posterior distribution. And then in terms of making optimal decisions, you have to write down the actions. The actions here are to deescalate, stay, or escalate the dose level. These are the different actions. And you also want to write down the loss function because we, when we talk about optimal decision, we need to know optimal to what. So the loss function allows us to uh, quantify the potential losses when we make the right or wrong decisions. Then the decision rule is essentially a function that maps the observed the data to the actions. Uh, that's, that, that's all it is. And then the optimal decision is a uh, decision rule is a type of decision rule that provides the smallest loss in some metric, for example, expected loss, because we don't know the truths, right? We don't know the true parameters. So therefore we need to estimate it. And so when we say the smallest loss, we, we have to estimate the loss. And one way to do that is to take expectation. So the base rule actually uh, is an optimal rule that uh, minimize the posterior expected loss, you integrate the loss function over the posterior distribution of the data, and you find the, the decision action that has the smallest um, has the smallest posterior expected loss, and such a rule is called a base rule. So in 2017, uh, in the MTPI2 paper, we show that the rules in MTPI, MTPI2, and keyboard uh, are based on the base rule for the model. And the model is such that we have a binomial likelihood, a beta in truncated beta 1-1 one, one, uh, prior on the probability uh, of toxicity at each dose, they're called theta. And then we also have a prior on the interval. There are three intervals for the MTPI and many intervals for the MTPI to a keyboard. Uh, and then the prior on the intervals are discrete uniform. The loss is zero one loss. If, you, if we set it up like this, then we go through the, uh, the derivation. We can show that the decisions uh, based on the UPM in these designs is the base rule. It minimizes the expected, uh, posterior expected the zero one loss. So that was the frame of uh, the background. Uh, I, I 
so this is not published yet, but uh, recently I uh, derived such uh, that the Boeing's uh, performance or optimization is actually also a base rule, but based on a very uh, interesting model. I'll briefly introduce this. Um, and then I, I won't have time to show uh, the detail of the proof, but in terms of the framework, the Boeing uh, decision is actually a base rule, the optimal rule. If we use, a, again, the binomial dis, uh, likelihood for the data, but we are restricting our prior distribution to three points. These three points are the, uh, the intervals uh, of the, let me go back to the figure here. The three points are the PT, the target, the left boundary of the equivalence interval and the right boundary of the equivalence interval. So as long as you're willing to assume the prior distribution actually take only three points, even though it's a probability of toxicity in the entire probability space, uh, then going through the same uh, uh, <clears throat> theoretical derivation, you can show that this rule uh, presented in CCD and Boeing design is actually optimal. It's a, a base rule. It minimized the expected loss. However, Bayesian did one more thing. When you write down the posterior expected loss, you can, it all of a sudden becomes a, a function of the two boundaries. And what they did is they did additional optimization to ask to minimize the base risk, risk or, or posterior expected uh, loss uh, according to these two uh, pre-specified boundaries. And if you do that because of the binomial sh shape of the likelihood, it actually gives you uh, two optimal boundaries, which are the lambdas in their paper. Um, so the, the question is, do we want to believe the probability of toxicity only take three values because that's what the priors is uh, suggesting. And uh, of course we don't wanna do that. However, I actually have no major issue with this. Uh, this sounds crazy, but uh, because we, we are not gonna, usually we don't believe the probability only takes three uh, values uh, in our prior distribution. But again, we are trying to do this to uh, accommodate uh, ethical and uh, you know, the easy to use desirability from practical applications. Uh, but going to, to uh, even expand a little bit, uh, essentially, we are talking about a set of decision rules that are based on the point estimate, right? There's no variability involved in this decision rule. We're just comparing the point estimate to two uh, boundaries. And if this decision rule actually is a base rule. And the base, the base rule corresponding to a reasonable uh, model, except if we are willing to assume the prior distribution only takes uh, three points. And then, and, and because of that, uh, I start to understand why these uh, very simple rules can lead to very desirable uh, operating characteristics in simulations. However, I would argue that the optimization of the two boundaries are not necessary, especially before we see any data. It doesn't make sense to me. And then in fact, it creates problems. So what kind of problems? So remember the procedure is the following. You first elicit the boundaries from uh, clinicians. Let's call them phi one and phi two. The, this is the equivalence interval that physicians feel comfortable with. And then through the optimal procedure in the Boeing design, they actually shrink the two uh, boundaries into smaller points. So the, this, this is the optimal equivalence interval under the Boeing. And they are nested in the original illicit uh, interval. Um, and this, cre this creates a problem. The problem is that there's a gap. So originally this, th this is the illicit interval. This is the orange color are the uh, optimal interval. There's a gap on the left and gap on the right. And if you read the original Boeing paper in 2015, the gaps are not a function of anything. Uh, they're, sorry, they're a, a function of the phi's, but they're not a function of the sample size. In other words, this gap will always be there no matter how large your trial is. When you recruit more and more patients, larger and larger, it will still always be there. It's not a function of the M. So why, why do we want it to be a function of M? Because we know these are estimates 
And then ideally they should be conditional on the data when the data approach infinity based on asymptotic theory, we want them to approach our pre-specified intervals because that's what we want, right? So um, the fact that it doesn't go there is theoretically is interesting. However, th uh, in practice, uh, very rarely a dose uh, with a true probability might fall into this gap. And then the interpretation will be very, uh, will be inconsistent. So when a dose is actually here, for example, based on the original interval, it's considered equivalent to the MTD, uh, which means the, when we treat patients at this dose, we want to continue to treat patients because it's good enough. It's, it's already within our equivalence interval. However, based on the optimal interval, it's outside. Uh, when the dose is on the left-hand side here, then the implied decision should be to escalate. That contradict our original uh, desirability of the equivalence in interval elicited by the by the physicians, and all of the all of, of the reasons that we have the gap here is because uh, in the Boeing there is an additional uh, minimization step that minimizes the base risk as these uh, input parameters, uh, and then the reason there's a op optimal solution is because we're using binomial likelihood. Uh, there, this is the theory I, I found out. And, and so we're essentially uh, trying to optimize uh, according to the binomial likelihood. And before we actually see any data, we're changing the boundaries that are elicited. And then really later I'll show that if you just stick to the original boundary, the performance is almost identical. So to me, there's no need to perform this additional optimization step. It actually creates problem instead of uh, making it better. Uh, and, and one more thing before I go into the simulation results, uh, which is when uh, designs are so simple, you really don't need to uh, resort everything in the simulation to evaluate these designs because they're so transparent. So to me, uh, the designs on this ch uh, chart here, so these designs, I3 plus 3 MTPIs and Boeing and CCD, there are three elements that can give you a very quick assessment of how they would perform without even running simulations. The first one is you ask if they have safety rules. These safety rules usually stop the trial or exclude the doses when the posterior probability of the, of the dose rate, a toxicity rate is greater than the target. If that posterior probability is greater than say 0.95, you would stop the trial if it's the first dose or ex exclude the dose if it's not the first dose. So this is the safeguard that we need for these designs. And the second one is how the MTD is selected after uh, the trial is completed. At the moment, most, uh, most of these designs actually use a very simple decision rule, uh, which is also proposed in the, originally by the CRM. It's just to look at the uh, estimate of a toxicity rate at the end and see which dose is closest to the target uh, with the caveat that these estimates need to be isotonically transformed to follow the monotonicity assumption. But all the these interval designs actually do, do this. And then except for CCD, all the interval designs also have the same safety rules. So the only difference is the decision tables. Uh, different, uh, different inference rules uh, generate a different, uh, slightly different decision tables so what, what you need to do is actually generate these tables and look, look how different they are. So for example, this is the difference between MTPI and TPI2. What you see is that there are more yellows in the MTPI, which are the state decisions. Uh, and there are more uh, Ds or the, the purple or the blue colors, which are the non-state decisions in MTPI2. And you would probably uh, immediately have a sense already that the MTPI2 is, is a design that likes to move away from the trial than the MTPI. And you just show, uh, uh, generate these decision tables and you can quickly compare the designs. So very interestingly, we can compare uh, a spawn design and then modify the CCD design because the original CCD design doesn't have the safety rule. So we, we added the, the same safety rules in the Boeing design, in the MTPI design, and we call this MCCD. But the first thing we lo looked at is that how different are the decisions? Because you know, the only difference is the Boeing use uh, the optimal e uh, equivalence interval. 
and then CCD just use the user elicited interval. And you can see this is a table summarize the difference between their decisions uh, for up to 51 patients with different epsilons. These are different equi equivalence intervals. And when the PT is set at 0.3, there's essentially no difference for up to 13, 26 decisions for 51 patients. So you can safely now say that for PT equals 0.3, the two designs are equivalent, are the same, because again, they use the same safety rule, they use the same MTD selection, and the decision tables are the same. So you don't need, even need to do any simulations to compare them. What we also have done PT, when PT equals 0.2 and 0.1, uh, generally there's less than 1% or like 0.5% difference across these, uh, these two des uh, designs. And, and sometimes actually simulation results can be misleading. Uh, again, these are the two elements uh, I would uh, definitely recommend you to look at when you compare, want to compare interval-based designs. Uh, the simulation results are, have been gold standard, especially in the, in the past three decades when we develop, continue to develop new methods. We generate uh, clinical trials using computers and uh, we look at the operating characteristics. The, what I found out at least, um, I firmly believe that there's no single design that can dominate another design in all scenarios. If you are somewhat experienced in this uh, type of research, you, you, you know that you can always generate a scenario that agrees uh, very closely to the assumption of a one design. And if you use that scenario, because the scenario agrees with the assumption, it's like the truth agrees with your model assumption, your method is gonna perform the best in that scenario. And this type of scenario can be designed for almost any design. So when you show simulation results, if you decide to include those scenarios, you'll see that those designs corresponding to the truth will perform the best, right? So in other words, we have to be careful when we uh, read or conduct these reviews, uh, when, we, when the only criteria uh, or the main criteria is to compare the simulation results of the designs because you know the simulation is essentially in in an infinite space of possible scenarios and no matter what we do we are only uh, presenting a finite set of uh, results based on finite set of scenarios so that that was my uh, caution when we uh, uh, conduct these reviews uh, and the lastly i want to uh, finish up with the i3 plus 3 design uh, this is a very major surprise and also kind of contradict my background as a statistician, but uh, I wanna be practical and honest uh, on what I found and therefore we reported this new design called I3 plus three. So the motivation is the following. I kept mentioning the design, the uh, rules here uh, in the CCD and Boeing are based on a point estimate. And then I call this, these rules are the ones that ignore variability regardless how the rules are, are derived, they may involve minimizing some binomial likelihood with variabilities in the likelihood, the rules themselves only use a point estimate. So in other words, let's say if one over n is 0 0.5, it can be three out of six, that's 0 0.5, 30 out of 60, or 3,000 out of 6,000. They all give you the same rate, and they all give you the same um, uh, decisions based on this rule. but then the, the variability is ignored, right, in the decision rule. The hallmark of statistics, one of them at least, is variability. So if we don't, if we ignore our variabilities in the decision rule, then why do we want need a model to give such a decision rule? So remember, you know, this picture, we started out with no models as a three plus three, and then we did all this work by various, you know, great, statisticians over the past decades. And I start to ask, okay, if we come uh, end to this, then why bother with a model? Can we do, uh, can we have a good design without a model? Meaning, can we have a rule-based design? Uh, the answer is yes, and it's uh, called I3 plus three. Uh, and then before I introduce I3 plus three, I just wanna quickly categorize the interval-based designs uh, now into two categories. One is the I design, the interval designs, which actually use the posterior probability of the intervals for the decision-making. 
And the other one, I, I now call it interval boundary designs. They're really not using the posterior probabilities of the interval. They're essentially using an interval as a boundary for the decision rule. And the decision rule is based on point estimate. And this is seen in you know, CCD point I3 plus three. But for the others, uh, they use uh, probabilities, which requires models. Uh, so what is I3 plus three? It's a rule-based design and it can be explained in 30 seconds. So the, these are the rules. Again, you use the same point estimate uh, of the toxicity rate, y divided by n. And you also have these boundaries. The boundaries are elicited from the physicians. So they don't need to change them. And you just ask where, where the observed rate is. If it's less than the left boundary, it's underdosing escalate. If it's in, inside the boundary, then you stay. Uh, if it's greater than the boundary, then here is the one little thing we did, extra piece we did. Uh, if the y minus one divided by n is less than the uh, left boundary, then it means the observed rate is greater than the right hand side of the it's above the uh, interval. The if you take one uh, toxicity event out of the data, then the observed rate would be below the interval. In other words, one unit change in the event uh, would result in a big jump from above the boundary to the below the boundary then you, you don't really have enough information to tell if the boundary is hit, right? In other words, one over n, that's the smallest uh, unit of information in the binomial sampling. If that is actually larger than the length of the equivalence interval, then you can't really tell if, if it's above or below the interval. And therefore the decision is to stay, to accumulate more data on the same dose until you can distinguish the difference between the two. And otherwise, if, if you can, then the decision is to de-escalate because the observed rate is too high. So that's it, that, that, that's the design. And it's called I3 I plus three. As you can see, it has nothing to do with three plus three. Uh, I uh, denotes the interval. Uh, the reason we use the name is just to be more, I guess, catchy because, you know, if I say, if we say I A plus B, you know, it's not as um, resonating as I3 plus three. And uh, uh, there are some caveat, there's some differences between you know, this rule uh, and the traditional rule, uh, or not the traditional, the rules that without this uh, additional component. So you can see if the uh, target is 25% as the MTD, the equivalence interval is from 20% to 30%. Uh, we have seen this quite often in practice actually. Uh, then there's a difference between the two uh, designs between I2 plus and Boy. Uh, the difference is in when you observe one TLT out of three patients, uh, then based on the I3 plus three, the decision is to stay. Based on the Boeing design is to de-escalate because one third is above the right-hand side of the interval. Uh, but according to the I3 plus three design would actually stay because you know, uh, Y minus one would, would be zero out of three. Uh, that would be below the interval and therefore the decision is to stay. So we're not saying one is better than the other, uh, but I think uh, in our experience with clinical team, they feel, usually feel more comfortable with this uh, decision because I guess they are very used to the three plus three design, right? So when you see one out of three patients, you want to stay rather than to de-escalate. Otherwise, they, uh, we can easily prove a theorem when one out of n is uh, greater than the length of the interval than the three, uh, the th these three designs are identical because when n is big, uh, this line here would never occur um, when, whenever the sample size become a, li a little bigger. So uh, very quickly, the examples of I3 plus three decisions. Uh, so let's say the target is 17%, the equivalence interval is from plus minus 5% from 12 to 22%. Then if you have three patients treated, the, when zero of them have DLTs, the I3 plus three would suggest to escalate. If one of them has DLTs, you stay, two or three, you have de-escalate. Uh, the caveat is here again, one out of three is above the interval, but uh, zero out of three is below the interval. Therefore, this uh, point is considered not informative and therefore we want to uh, stay, continue to enroll patients. However, when we have a different scenario when the interval is from 25% to 35%, uh, 
and uh, with six patients, then everything are expected. If it's less than the interval, you escalate. If it's in the interval, you stay. If it's above the interval, you deescalate. Another interesting thing is that I3 plus 3 seems to be the compromise between the MTPI and the BOIN or CCD, uh, or even MTPI too. Uh, essentially, again, I mentioned that, you know, sometimes the I3 plus 3, uh, let's go here. Uh, the I3 plus 3 here would deescalate when, sorry, which one? Oh, would stay actually. Uh, when three patients are treated and uh, one of them have DLTs, and the equivalence interval is actually smaller than one third, then it would stay. And point or MTPI2 would deescalate, but MTPI would actually uh, uh, to stay here because of the Occam's razor. But when it's uh, six patients, then the I3 plus we actually now agree with point design, disagree with the MTPI design when three out of six patients having DLTs. Uh, and that seems also to be what we want. Uh, as a, a safety constraint. So in other words, it seems that I3 plus 3 is taking the better decisions out of you know, the previously published ones. And uh, again, uh, without doing any simulations, we can quickly compare the two designs, the Boeing and I3 plus 3 in terms of decision tables. Uh, this is the same one with 51 patients uh, with different equivalence intervals. The target is 30%. Uh, the difference is up to 14 different decisions between the two designs. Uh, that's about 1% out of the 13, 26 uh, possible decisions. So we all know, then based on this, we should probably know that uh, they perform similarly. Now, the last topic, which is how do we even evaluate the simulation results, regardless of, you know, there's so many different scenarios that can be generated. This is a screenshot of uh, one of the uh, software, that commercial software that's out there. It reports all these operating characteristics like MTD selections in terms of selecting the MTD, selecting doses over the MTD, no selections, and then patient assignment, correct as allocation, overdosing, uh, and then overall toxicities, uh, stopping and trial sample size, right? There's so many things to look at when, when you actually want to compare the designs. Um, so again, this is not published yet. We try to summarize them in a single score as an initial quick evaluation. We call this currently J-score. Uh, I won't go into the details, but you can see the J-score is based on utilities uh, in terms of you know, what you think you're gonna gain if you actually select the right MTD versus you, if you select the dose over the MTD or, or below the MT, MTD or above the MTD. So that's the selection part. But what about the patient allocation? Because these are human subjects, what would, would you consider to have a you know, utility, the gain, if you actually put patients on the MTD or on doses below the MTD or on, on doses above the MTD? Depending on the developmental strategy, sometimes the, pro, uh, the sponsors think the drug is extremely safe, then they're willing to risk and then be more aggressive in their escalation then they would have a smaller penalty for these above MTDs than the penalty for the um, than the penalty for the below MTDs. But most of the time, we want to be conservative, and therefore the penalties for below usually is uh, higher than the penalty for above. But then you sum, you combine these two utilities, and when you have multiple com uh, uh, designs to compare, you can con calculate the relative utilities, and that's the J score. So the J score at the end is a, a value between zero and one. The larger the value, the better the design among the ones you're comparing. We did some simula initial simulations. We used about 2000 scenarios generated by our software users. And we categorize, as I mentioned, that you can always find a, a scenario that you know, makes one of the designs look really good. So we want to uh, do a little bit better job just by reporting the average behavior of the designs. We divided these 2000, almost 2000 scenarios into three categories based on a single metric. The metric is the distance between the MTD and adjacent doses. So that means, uh, this means the larger the distance, the more spread out the, uh, the scenarios are. It's more, it's more like having a larger effect si size uh, for finding the MTD then therefore the easier the scenario. So the, the D is the distance 
which is uh, when it's smaller, then it's harder. When it's larger, it's easier. So we split it into like these different categories uh, in terms of the difficulty level of the scenarios. They are roughly, uh, you know, e e e uh, similarly distributed to our surprise. Um, so our users know actually they, they want to use different types of scenarios. And we run, uh, uh, we compared uh, how many designs I forgot, um, maybe all of the designs in that tree. And then based on different developmental strategies, these are the penalties uh, for underdosing or overdosing. And then by having different ratios of these penalties, we're essentially uh, proposing, for example, I want to be aggressive in our dose in my dose, in my trial. I want to be neutral, considering both safety and uh, efficiency in escalation. Or I want to be conservative. I I don't want to go fast. I want to make sure the patients are safe. And then the reported ones uh, values here in the parentheses are the J score. Uh, essentially, it's closer to one. Uh, the better the design among the pack. Um, so as you can see, we uh, for each of these uh, distance and each of the developmental strategies, we basically report the top three designs with the highest uh, J, J score. And you can see uh, that, again, this is actually to my surprise that the I3 plus three design would do so well in, in, uh, in across most of these uh, cases. I have no clue. Uh, why it would, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't expect this at all because uh, one thing that we did was when we included these scenarios, the I3 plus 3 design was, was not even published. Uh, we've never run I3 plus 3 design on these scenarios. But otherwise, CRM uh, is pretty good uh, when uh, the strategy uh, is, wants to be aggressive, when the, when the drug is pretty safe, and the MTPI is also. Um, shows up in two cases. But again, I, I wanna say one more thing. Uh, I'm coming to end here. Uh, even this J score does not tell you the entire picture. Uh, another uh, metric that is not included in this comparison is the decision table. As I was mentioning, uh, this decision table essentially because of the simplicity of these uh, interval designs, can really tell you a lot. It basically tells you what you would be doing uh, when the trial data follows each one of these uh, cells here. So look at them, and then uh, when you want to compare designs, uh, put them side by side, and then ask yourself which one uh, is what you want. Uh, sometimes there's really not a, um, a clear uh, cut here, like there's no right or wrong. For example, if you have uh, two patients treated and one of them have, has DLTs, what do you do? Do you stay there or do you de-escalate? Which one is correct, right? So the, these are the cho choices we make. And when we make them, we just need to state uh, what our reason is and our assumption is. Um, there is no, sometimes there's no clear uh, cut off uh, in terms of uh, right or wrong here. So the comparison of the decision table in a, addition to a simulation study like this might be um, a good exercise uh, going forward because it covers both what you want to do actually in practice and then uh, give a somewhat more detailed comparison in terms of breakdowns of the scenarios and in terms of your developmental strategies. And that can perhaps can be combined. Uh, so in conclusion, I think this hopefully is helpful uh, as a tutorial. There's a lot of things in it. Uh, the model-based methods are very powerful. Uh, they follow our uh, formal statistical principles uh, in every other applications, not necessarily, necessarily in those finding designs, but in our uh, general statistical practice and then should be applauded. The, the problem is uh, the model misspecification and also the extreme safety constraint that usually is not incorporated in, in these model-based designs. And then also the MTPI is not safe because you know three out of six is uh, is uh, stay but not deescalate. This is true, uh, but it also depends on our loss function. So again, if we deal with non-human subjects, then maybe MTPI is not a bad choice because again, it's based on Occam's razor, which is a good statistical principle. Uh, and CCD and Boeing are model-assisted designs. Uh, they are, but I, to me, model-assisted is still model-based. 
Uh, and then there's these uh, designs here, MTPI, MTPI2, Boeing keyboard. Uh, they are all model-based designs and in particular MTPI2 and keyboard are the same. So you can use them equivalently. And then the final question, which is the tough one, like there's so many designs, which one should I use, right? Uh, the answer, sorry, it's not uh, absolute, it depends. Uh, so for classical single agent DLT based cohort enrollment phase one trial, uh, physicians, if you, are, if you don't want to have too much statistical uh, involvement, then I, again, I'm biased, uh, but, um, based on my objective research that I just reported, I would say the I3 plus three is probably a good one because there's no model involved. Physicians uh, can basically go to these five sentences uh, and then be able to understand uh, what to do. Um, and, some, and there's an occasion where the MTPI can be considered, uh, MTPI two can be considered. Uh, I don't have time for, for that, uh, maybe in the future, is when the drug is very, very safe. Um, and CRM is really good. There are so many software out there and their guidance, their papers that tell you what to do. However, be mindful that if you decide to do it, then make sure there's enough uh, sufficient statistical expertise and, uh, expertise and support. Uh, Boeing is also really, really good. It performs very well. Uh, if you look at uh, some recent papers, review papers in particular, they show really good performance uh, when it's compared to other designs. But you know, as I mentioned, that there are scenarios, uh, and cases, and settings uh, you have to be mindful when you read them. Uh, the issue is this has theoretical uh, problem. I don't want to assume that my prior only takes three points, rather, uh, uh, and and because it's a, a probability, I don't want to do that. Uh, so uh, at the end, but all of the, these designs are good. Uh, it just uh, after three decades, you know, at least to me as. I start to realize that when we have ha very heavy uh, safety regulation uh, for even treating one more patient with toxicity at a dose, uh, it's not acceptable. And then we want to have simple and model-based inference. When we combine these two constraints together, uh, we might end up with role-based design uh, back again. Uh, again, personal uh, preference or opinion uh, so you know this is uh, this is what I get at the end uh, from from uh, from the research in this area. So I thank you for your time, and hopefully uh, there is some uh, there's time for questions, and uh, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Zhi. Uh, a couple of questions came in at the end. I don't know if you want to take a look at those. Yes. Um, so uh, let me read it out. Uh, so this is from Andrew Bing. Are there any modifications needed for implementing these designs for drug combination studies? Um, are any extra considerations if there is a historical data on the drugs involved? Uh, great questions. Uh, so the questions, there are two parts. One is about uh, the drug combination studies and the other one is about involving historical data. Um, so the drug combination, uh, I want to, you just need to uh, make sure it's what type of drug combination. Is it a novel, novel combination, meaning each drug would actually have multiple doses? Then that becomes a two dimensional dose finding studies. None of the designs I mentioned here uh, in this talk uh, are meant for those uh, trials. Uh, it, but there are also the type of drug combination studies where one drug is fixed as the approved dose, like a pembrolizumab, PD1 inhibitor. Uh, plus a novel drug, which has a varying doses, then you can treat such a combination study as a single agent study because on, only one drug has different doses and the designs mentioned in this talk uh, can be applied. Uh, for designs having historical data, I know there are two development uh, new designs uh, that are coming out. One is called, I think it's called iBoing. Uh, I think there's an archive paper out there uh, which has a unified framework to incorporate uh, the historical data using Boeing keyboard and CRM. Uh, we have a paper and actually on our shiny package uh, that's coming out uh, probably next week, we'll upload it, uh, called a HI3 plus three, uh, HI3 plus three, H means historical data. 
that incorpor incorporate uh, historical data into the I3 plus 3 framework. But it is a model assisted design because the design actually has two parts, one with model, one without. So I hope this answered the question. Um, and uh, the second one is I have two questions. One, from regulatory point of view, which design is the most recommended? Uh, I can very quickly answer that. I don't think regulatory agencies recommend any designs uh, because of their neutrality. Uh, they rarely e endorse any designs. Uh, so I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't call any designs being recommended or not. Usually what you need to do when you have a submission to the regulatory body uh, is to incorporate the detail of the design. Uh, if you're using your own program, then attach the program. If you're using software, point out the version of the software, attach the simulation results at the end, and then explain the reasons why you're selecting the design by using. And if all, all of these are reasonable, then my own experience is that uh, there's a, you know, probably a very good chance that uh, they'll agree with the design of the choice. The second question is, what is the appropriate reference for I3 plus 3 design to refer in the protocol, for example? The I3 plus 3 design has a publication. Um, uh, it's published in Journal of Biopharmaceutical Statistics. If you Google that, you'll easily uh, find out. And there's another question. What are the study st uh, stopping rules for I3 plus 3? That's a good question. So the, the stopping rules for I, the question is what is the stop, stopping rule for I3 plus 3? Their stopping rule is the same uh, across all these, most of these interval designs. First, uh, if the sample size has reached the largest pre-specified number like 30, or the lowest dose is deemed too toxic. Remember that early stopping rule? Uh, if the lowest dose is, you know, has a higher high posterior probability to be greater than uh, the target, then you stop. Yeah, the first one here. Uh, another question. Thank you for the nice tutorial. Thank you. Uh, agree on the comments on situations on the design part. Can you elaborate on the difference between CRM and BRM? Also their pros and cons. Um, I think both are great. Um, for CRM, I, I think there are uh, sufficient matured tools out there that you can choose. And uh, I would probably use, I, I stopped following the most recent ones, but when I was studying CRM, the DF CRM by Ken Chang uh, is a free R package, had all the uh, things in it to make sure the CRM performs well, um, mainly the incoherence and the uh, overdose control, they're all there. And they also have a nice function to get the uh, skeletons automatically for you. So BRIM, I think you ha there's one thing you need to be careful, the default setting of the overdose control to me is very conservative. If you run that, you'll see that the, tr uh, the design actually is reluctant to escalate. So this part, if you want to escalate with some uh, reasonable speed, then watch out for that and you want to uh, calibrate that. Um, the two designs are, you know, they're model based and uh, I, I think they're, they're good. <laughs> you just need to know the model parameters and then uh, calibrate them uh, for your trial and it involves usually quite some work, so. Uh, I think I, I have a, uh, wait, there's another question. How did you account for different average sample sizes from the different design options in the comparisons? Yeah, so the, uh, it's a good, uh, so you have to be mindful of a uh, short answer. So for example, in our comparison to the three plus three design, we did a lot of work trying to match the average sample size because three plus three design prematurely stopped the trial when six patients are, are treated as some dose. Uh, so we need to make sure that our the average sample size of model-based designs are the same as the uh, average sample size of three plus three design. This was in our two, two, 2013 paper. For the other designs without uh, three plus three, uh, again, this is the slides. Uh, the only way that the trial will stop is either reach the maximum sample size 
and the other one is the this stopping rule. And all of them use the same stopping rule. So all you need to do is to specify the same maximum sample size, then it becomes a fair comparison. Uh, usually they end up with very uh, similar average sample size barring for any simulation noise. Uh, I, I think I reached the end of, the, oh, there's one more. Uh, whether any designs take into account if more than one DLT occurred in one patient? No. So the currently the outcome, so the question is, will any designs accommodate more than one DLT event I'd rather than just say if there's a DLT or no? Um, I think the designs mentioned in this talk only treats the outcome as a binary, either meaning yes or no DLTs, but not in terms of the frequency or the number of DLT events. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, isn't the point that the three plus three is too small, just like any other underpowered study? I agree, yeah. I think the main problem with the three plus three design is the small sample size, which leads to large variabilities for downstream decision making. If you just look at the decision rules within those of the framework of three plus three, they makes pretty, they're, they're pretty good. They actually are pretty smart. For example, one out of three is a stay, but one out of uh, two out of six is a deescalate. So this intrinsically has some variability considerations in the designs but it only, it's, it only goes up to six, right? So what happens when you uh, want to treat more? And that's the main problem. But the, the society, especially you know, after so many years are used to the small phase one program. Although the, there, this seems to be changing because you know, people start to realize a shaky foundation from, for, for the phase one program is not necessarily the best strategy for later drug development. And therefore these other designs allow you opportunities to enroll more than six patients with reasonable uh, rules. And so I think that's where their real advantage in practice are for these other designs. And the question is, will the slides be available? I'd be very happy to make it available. I'll uh, work with Rick, uh, is that possible? Absolutely, no problem. Okay. Okay, I, I think that's that's it. Uh, I don't see any questions. No, I think you've covered them all. Uh, Dr. Zhi, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very nice, appreciate that. And I wanna thank everyone for attending. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and shut down the webinar. Everyone have a wonderful day. Goodbye now. Thank you, bye.